when I like talk to kids or whatever about sneakers, invariably someone's wearing a pair of Converse high tops. Yeah. The Converse All Star came out in 1917, mm-hmm. and it's incredible to me that can you imagine designing something in 1917 and kids still thinking it's cool? Yeah. My name is Elizabeth Semelhag. I'm the director and senior curator of the Battashee Museum here in Toronto, Canada. And currently we are in artifact storage. My name is Abby Albino. I am the co-founder of Makeway, which is North America's first sneaker boutique for women and completely run and funded by women. My co-founder, Shelby Weaver and I, we really recognize a void in the sneaker industry as sneaker lovers through and through and people who have worked in basketball and kind of been around the sneaker game for a really long time. We found it was difficult and challenging as Canadian women to access sneakers that we wanted to purchase. The women were kind of kept out of sneaker consumption in a meaningful way for decades and decades and decades. Once we kind of looked more deeply into that, we recognized that the reason there was a lack of access was because there was lack of infrastructure in the sneaker game for women. Even as nascent sneaker culture is emerging out of New York City in the, in the 1970s, it becomes sort of globalized in the 80s. Footwear is linked to constructions of social identity. It's linked to economics. It's linked to environment and resource availability. And sneaker manufacturers never make the most desirable sneakers in women's sizes. It's a really interesting form of footwear to consider constructions of gender. It starts out as a signifier more of status than gender. And so the sneakers I have pulled will allow us to sort of explore these stories and across from the origin of the sneaker to where we are today. And truly, it ends on a hopeful note because things are really changing in very interesting ways. I think footwear in history and how society functions is so incredibly intertwined from innovation to where the world is going from a like societal standpoint. I've pulled some sneakers that sort of talk about the history of women in relation to sneakers. And the first pair I have is from the turn of the 20th century, late 19th century. This is a pair of women's tennis shoes. One of the things that people think about about early sneakers is that they think, oh, you know, they were probably just cheap canvas and rubber soles. This was an expensive and expensive material. In fact, to have a pair of rubber overshoes cost five times the cost of a pair of leather shoes. So early tennis shoes were using the coolest new material, but they were expensive and they were used to play the newly revived game of lawn tennis. All of these nouveau riche wanted to be able to show that they had arrived. Tennis was an athletic activity that men and women did together. You know, we say love in tennis, but tennis actually took on these concepts of coupling, of meeting the right man, showing up with the well-turned outfit, and looking great while you played the sport. So these ideas of athleticism and femininity were tied to traditional concepts of like being attractive, but there were also ideas that women could participate, particularly white upper-class women, could participate in active sports. I just think that like right now, it's such a funny time to look back and see that first women's tennis shoe and think about all the things that went into it and why it became so popular at the time was because of the era it was in and then because of the products and resources they had available to them. So super interesting now that we're so many years later and seeing how much footwear and sneakers or just footwear in general really inform who a person is and what the world is doing at the time.